Hey there, strategic entrepreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We are here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writing career. Welcome to episode nine of the Strategic Entrepreneur Podcast. On today's show, we're going to talk about generation versus transformation in your creative life and in your business. Last week's episode was a long one, but a good one with Liza Palmer. We had our first guest interview and we were talking about social media. Some highlights, we're not boiling the ocean. And as my daughter texted me after listening to the episode, her absolute favorite quote was that authenticity is the little black dress of social media. Looks good everywhere. This week, we are back to just us for this week, and that's what you can expect from us. We're going to alternate every other week. We'll be just the two of us diving into some topic in depth discussion, and the alternate weeks will be a special guest interview and then a discussion off the backside of that about how we're going to apply whatever we learned from those experts. But before we get started with today's topic, let's do a quick check-in. So, Michele, what have you been up to this past week? We always start with like, uh, at least it's been like that for the past few weeks. So I feel like uh, I need to suggest another book if you don't have enough. So the book that I'd like to suggest this week is Tools of Titans uh, by Tim or Timothy Ferris, whichever you prefer. And it's a huge, huge book. And uh, I don't know if you can see this on the video, but uh, Krista also has it. And it did, this was not coordinated. Uh, we didn't expect. Uh, she didn't know that I was uh, going to present this, but I was very happy that she also knew, was familiar with the, the book. Uh, it's a great reading, and it's basically uh, Timothy Ferris, which is a super famous like blogger slash podcaster, uh, which is basically interviewing like dozens of successful people from uh, actors to entrepreneurs to um, explorer even. And the book is divided in three parts. And uh, one is uh, uh, for healthy health, uh, then there is wealthy, and then there is the wise. And every single time uh, is basically uh, asking questions to a person that is uh, um, that can be something related to, for example, entrepreneurship. Every single time uh, he asks questions, I feel like I get uh, I get out with something uh, of an information that is more useful for me. Even though if these people are some, are like let's say people that are doing completely different things that I'm doing, uh, I always find uh, them to be very motivational. And um, there is uh, uh, a couple of uh, of times that I uh, I've read uh, uh, interviews in this book. One was with Paolo Coelho, for example. Is one of the people in the book. Uh, there is Seth Godin. Uh, I like Seth Godin a lot. Uh, if you are familiar with his blog, with his podcast, Akimbo, every single time I uh, I read uh, the struggle that uh, and the teaching that these people have to have, I found uh, I came up with something of value. And in this book, you're gonna get dozens of them. And Tim did a very good job in asking the right questions. So I would totally, uh, definitely suggest you to read this. I am just getting started with this book. It only arrived a couple of weeks ago, so I am poking around and seeing what is what. But yes, it's a nice giant doorstop of a thing. Yeah. Um, this past week, I've been really focused on thinking about with all the changes going on in the world and with us all being at home and a lot of the events we're usually part of not really happening um, due to the social distancing movement. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about what I want my days to look like, what I want my weeks to look like, which projects I really want to focus on over the next year, and just thinking about how I want all that to work. And two of my favorite books on um, kind of narrowing things down, Essentialism, by Greg McCowan, I think is how you say his last name, maybe not. And the other one is called The One Thing by Gary Keller. And what's really interesting for those of you who are not looking at the video right now, but are listening to us, is the, the covers are black, white, and red, and both have really different designs, but have some similarities between them. So I think it's just really interesting um, when you get that. And actually, I was looking at, um, other possibilities of what to read next 
And the War of Art was the third one that I thought of. And all three of these have white covers with black and red writing. Um, and it was just an interesting kind of coincidence. Um, but I like to group books together and I will pick two or three of my favorites on a topic if I'm in a particular phase for something. And then I will read them all and then kind of compress all the notes from all of them. So um, for me right now, I'm just thinking about what is the one thing I want to concentrate on uh, for this next few week period here? And what do I want to get rid of and or narrow down to make space for the one thing that I'm going to do? So for me, that's where I'm at is just really clearing the decks and thinking about being very intentional in terms of rebuilding things. And that's part of where today's topic came from was uh, Michaela and I have a, a Monday standing appointment to do a coaching session. And we were talking about um, what he's doing in his business and how that works. And this kind of came out of it. So I don't know if you maybe want to introduce that um, and just tell, tell everybody where did the, the concept come from and, and why was it so interesting to us yeah. to get started into? Yeah, I'd love to. So I had mentioned this before, like I like to think of myself as a, like a sponge. Uh, and in uh, the, one of the latest uh, um, session that I had with, uh, with Crystal, um, I asked her a question about uh, a side of my business that I'm working on, which is basically to not as much as rebranding, but I would say like to paint um, a series that I published in the Italian market uh, um, and make it a bit more professional, if I, if I can say that. And um, uh, she came up with a couple of words that I didn't actually uh, know and that I didn't really apply. Um, she, she basically explained to me first that what I was really wanted to do was a book makeover, not, not as much as like a changing or rebranding or completely repackaging something. And then from that discussion, uh, we came to two words. And these two words are going to be the bedrock of this episode. Uh, one is uh, uh, generation, and the other one is transformation. Um, and I didn't know what those words you know, like meant. So I've asked her, like, just give me a simple definition of what they are. And she did. And I think this is a very interesting starting point for today's conversation. What's the generation and what's transformation? Because the moment I realized what they were, as always, uh, I like to think that I'm very curious. So I bombarded her with questions and she gave me a lot of uh, interesting uh, example, examples. And then when the conversation was done, I, um, I started researching and I started doing my things and applying what I've learned on my day-to-day -day things. Uh, and I can honestly tell you that after she explained to me what they meant and why they were important, I was able to use my time in a better way. And I'm going to tell you exactly what this generation transformation things uh, mean. If you are as us interested in making uh, uh, it as an author, as an entrepreneur in the long run, uh, you're going to have to deal with uh, a couple of different uh, kind of creative endeavors. It's like uh, when we say generation and transformation, uh, they kind of sound similar, but actually they are very, very different. Uh, when you're generating content, uh, you're using a part of your brain and resources that you're not using when you're transforming content. So a simple example of generation would be like, uh, okay, I personally wake up at 6.30 a.m. and at usually 7 to 7.30, I sit for one hour or two and I write new content. Uh, it can be like uh, anything from a short story, a novella, maybe it's a free writing se session. I just know that from 7 to 8 or from 7 to 9, uh, if I have a deadline to meet, that's a moment in which I have to generate content. I need to give to those two hours the very best. I have to basically leave everything I've got most of my creative energy is spent in those two hours. There is no way for me to like just keep in writing for four to five hours. I know there are people that can do that, just not my thing, <laughs> if we can say that. And that's a simple explanation of what generation is for me, creating new content. Can I do that for three to four hours per day? No. 
might have been able maybe in years of training to kind of do something similar, it might. But it's not the point of today's episode. Point of today's episode is understanding that uh, once you know that that's basically the amount of time you can allocate uh, to generate new content, then you have uh, freedom to pass to the second part, which is basically transformation. And what is transformation? Uh, explained in my simple term, it's like taking something you already did and make it better uh, or make it shine a bit better. Uh, so, for example, in my case, I have a science fiction series in Italian, and uh, I really wanted to add more value, uh, and I wanted to change the back matter, the front matter. I wanted to basically uh, take away all the typos. This kind of endeavor, it, it's time-consuming, but it's a di very different kind of approach than of the generation. I'm not using as much energy, mind energy, if you want, spiritual energy, brain power, than when I have to come up with a new character, a new situation, a scene. The, it's involved, what's involved, it's you are basically allocating time into revamping something. And uh, the way you do it is by being very conscient, conscient of what you are doing and why. So. If you want uh, to revamp your series, uh, you know that maybe you want to allocate 10 hours to that, uh, you know you're not going to use any creative power to do that. But, and this is something that I just want to underline as much as possible, I really, really think that generation part of the day should be something that you kind of create as a daily routine, even if it's just 30 minutes per day, because Based on that, the new content is where like your real your career is gonna basically be based. So on the generation of new content, and it's difficult. Crystal, I have to say, it's not like a piece of cake. Uh, like every single time, uh, sitting there, and sometimes it's so daunting. And we we spoke about this. Like as writers, like it's not that difficult to write. The difficult part is like sitting to write. And I don't know about you. I then I told you this, but when I sit at seven at seven thirty, like I would say, like I I walk around the, the chair for a, I would say a couple of minutes, three minutes, uh, because I sometimes I I'm scared. It's not that much that I don't want to. It's more like I'm scared that I'm gonna lose two hours, uh, that I'm not gonna do anything valuable, and uh, this is something that I discussed already. When talking a bit about the book, uh, The War of Art, which you, you, you spoke about briefly today, it's really a battle with the generation kind of content. Krista is a battle against yourself. Uh, if you don't put 100% of uh, you in that game, like it's very simple. Resistance is going to kill you. And uh, it doesn't mean that you have to wake up at 6.30 or right at 7. That's not your thing. What I'm saying is if your creative power comes at midnight, do that, but just try to do it uh, on a daily basis. I don't know if uh, the process sound uh, the same for you, uh, Crystal, but I thought like when you first uh, familiarize with me with the concept of generation and transformation, and I started to think about that, I think my daily routine improved drastically from one day to the other because I could distinguish the two, right? Right. Yeah, I think so. Getting over the resistance is an interesting thing because psychologically, the more times we have been successful at doing it in the past, the more likely we believe we are to be successful doing it again. And so I think the value in a daily routine is often in training yourself to have those successful times to look back on. So if I have a daily routine and five days in the week, I sat down and I wrote even for even for 10 minutes then I have five instances in my recent memory where I did that thing successfully. And so when I go to sit down the next time, my mind starts to believe that I am a person who is capable of sitting in the chair and making the words when I have that appointment with myself. And so if you have a series of successful past events, it, it trains your brain to have faith in your abilities to do it again. And so I think especially if you're a newer writer, it's extra important to have 
that regular reinforcing experience, right? It's like anytime you're learning a new thing, if you do it a whole bunch in a row, then you get reasonably good at it. And then if there's a gap between when you do it next time, they say it's like riding a bike, right? If you know how to ride a bike and then you have a bit of a break, you can get back on the bike and you still know how to ride a bike. And writing is the same thing. I think we get in a a flow in a pattern, we we start to understand and really feel on the inside that we're capable of doing this. And it it's positive reinforcement is what it is. It creates a bit of a success cycle for us. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, I am not a good everyday writer. That is not really how I work. I'm a binge writer and I, I am the opposite of Michaela when it comes to my patterns. I'm very bad at sitting down and only writing for an hour or whatever it is in in my world, once I get in the zone, I just want to stay there until I'm finished whatever I'm doing. So, you know, I've had week, a week where I started working on something on like a Thursday morning and I really didn't come up for air until the next week when I had written, you know, 30,000 words. So for me, I, I do best when I really dive deep. And so that's partly also why I really notice a difference between generative uh, creativity and transformative creativity. Because once I have that first draft out, I can take weeks to edit it and I can polish it and I can change it into something that is worth showing to the world. But the initial fear, I find I get past that better just by knowing I have nothing else to devote myself to except that thing and that I can just go all in on that. So everybody has their own process, but but for me, I train myself to do regular writing with my nonfiction because it's a very different mindset than with the fiction. And so um, I am working on that over the next little while of making that an everyday habit instead of being so sporadic about it and having it be so project based. So I'm looking to find some balance in there by writing two different kinds of things, because then I have thinking time in between the creative projects that are fiction to go ahead and do some of the other nonfiction stuff. Um, so I think it was really interesting that you said it's often the fear that kind of stops you from just sitting down and diving in because generation, we're taking something that doesn't exist yet, that is ours and ours alone. And we are taking it from the outside of our brains and our or from the inside of our brains and imaginations. And we're putting it in the outside world where it is then subject to criticism. So it is very much that part that's really hard and there's nobody else to blame but ourselves if we don't get those words out the exact way that we wanted to so i think you know any time in our lives when we are 100% responsible for a thing it can be really really intimidating and so practicing getting things out of your head and onto the page um does build that confidence a little bit but then also practicing transforming things from their original state of how they came out of your brain into something better also helps feed the cycle of being able to generate things with less fear because you have experience at transforming it. You know that you can take whatever you got out of your head and make it better. So I think the two phases work really well together kind of in cycles and that that's um, thinking of it in those two different ways is very freeing. Do you find like a your fiction writing to be more difficult than your nonfiction? Do you find it to be like easier for you to write in that kind of style than the others? Because I'm, I'm, I'm very fascinated because I know uh, people that are listening to us, maybe they do both things. And maybe they want to know what do you do and what do you feel when you are approaching one side of the writing process on the nonfiction side and then on the fiction side? I think... I'm definitely more confident in the nonfiction because after 15 years of working in indie publishing and working in this zone, I understand how it works. And so it's not, it's not generative content for me when I'm writing nonfiction, it is transformational content because I have all of the information stored in my head. I'm just extracting it. I'm just taking it from my brain to the page but it's very different than writing fiction because in fiction, I'm creating the world that the characters live in. I'm creating the people, I'm creating the dialogue. It isn't a matter of just taking what I know and putting it on the page. I have to create what I know and then put it on the page. So yes, I, I am way 
more comfortable or I find it way easier to sit down and do the nonfiction. So whenever something is challenging in my life or things are very disrupted or there's a lot of stress from other places, I will find it very difficult to write the fiction. But I can often, I can do the nonfiction because it's using a different piece of my writing skills. It, it really is just taking the knowledge from existing up here in my head and it's it's making it into words on a page. So I think that is, there's definitely some differences. And I also have been playing around with not actually sitting all the time. So when I'm looking at uh, dictation as an option, so using uh, speech to text software to actually help with the writing process, because then I can walk around the park or I can sit outside on my deck or I can, you know, even just be in my office, but I can be sitting in a different chair or standing or walking around. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in that to kind of change things up. But I've been experimenting. And I am finding it's much, much easier to dictate nonfiction as well than it is to dictate the fiction. So I'm finding it's kind of disruptive, actually, that there's a certain learning curve in the fiction side for dictation that the way I've trained myself to get the stories from my brain to the page has to be transformed into something different in order for me to be able to dictate them. So for now, I'm just looking at getting comfortable with dictation for nonfiction. And then once I see how all of that works and I get really comfortable with it and that becomes not so much of a learning curve, then I will transition into the fiction, trying to dictate more so that I can be more active and more out and about uh, in terms of what I'm working on and what I'm doing. Going back to the generation kind of thing, there is something that I wanted to, to ask you that I think it, it might be interesting because it's something that I got from different source and I and you you know how much I like like to kind of uh, study after other writers what they're doing. Uh, and you know, um, you know, I have master class uh, and uh, that I'm reading as much as I can. So there was something that I found to be like a common train trait in some writers and these are writers different in uh, even culture because i was talking with uh, my wife and she told me that even a japanese writer had this kind of process so i'm just gonna tell you what it is um, and the other time that i kind of find it was from the world of art where pressfield was talking about that he was basically saying something similar to what you mentioned the more you write the more you find like yourself to be um, in the story with your characters and both of them uh, Pressfield and this Japanese uh, writer they were talking about uh, the news and I don't know how you want to call it like if we are you know believers and stuff God the news uh, or maybe just chemical stuff that work I'm just genuinely curious how do you explain that the more you are in the story and you do the work the more the story makes sense and uh, the more you write, the more like the writing is easy. Um, I don't know how to explain that, but it's not something that it's just happened to me. I know it happens to you. And there was uh, uh, Steven that was talking about that. And then I had this conversation about the Japanese writer. I know it's, it seems that it's something that many writers have if just they put enough work. Do you think like it has something to do with the generation kind of thing? Do you think it's something that is particular just maybe some left or right kind of writers. Uh, what do you think? Because like, it, it seems interesting to me. Well, I think whenever we're in a state of flow, um, this is something that is talked about in a bunch of different books. We've talked about uh, Deep Work by Cal Newport, and he talks a lot about flow. And it's basically when you get in a state of concentration where the rest of the world ceases to exist and you're so into what you're doing that your attention is not distracted by anything else. You are just in the zone is another way that we talk about that. And so I think sometimes when we talk about the muse, I think we're actually talking about this state of flow. I mean, you can be inspired and you have a great idea, but it's actually focusing in enough to do the thing without having your attention pulled away that really makes a difference of how it feels you know we we talk about like a runner's high when you get into that state of just pure concentration um and i think that we have a writer's high like that as well a bit too when you hit that state of flow and the words are just kind of pouring out of you and you're you're 
you just, you feel like everything is going really well and you're not having yourself constantly interrupted. So I read, I read a lot about attention and productivity and, and I'm a bit of a, a geek that way. My background as a health psychologist, um, I did most of my training stuff was like attention and memory and uh, stress and productivity and how all that stuff kind of comes together. And so I've always been fascinated with how our brains work. And one of the things that is very consistently shared is that we do not switch gears well. So when we're looking at um, our attention and how we focus on one thing and then another thing and then another thing, we don't multitask, we switch quickly between things, right? So there is no true multitasking. And we use energy every time we switch our focus points um, in our brains, with our eyes, all of those things. And there's a residual energy loss every time we do that. Um, you can only pull so much of your focus towards the thing you're working on. And there's always a little bit of a lag, right? So um, you end up with some of your attention that hasn't quite come with you and it has to catch up. So the faster you're switching focus is, the less active attention you actually have to work with. It's kind of like uh, working memory in your computer. If it's all being used up in, in saving something in the background, you're not able to open the current program you want to work on quickly, right? So it's that same idea with our, with our minds and with our energy. And I think when you're trying to get into the generative state of creativity, it is about flow and it's about energy. And because it is, it's hard. It's a thing where we are, we are creating something out of nothing. That is not easy. And it takes all of the bits of our brain to be really focused on that. We can't be worried about, you know, is our toddler in the next room pouring the cereal all over the floor, not into the bowl. And that's the tinkling sound we hear in the background. You know, we can't be thinking, oh, I, I just have to jot this one thing on my to-do list, or I really need to let the dog out because he's scratching at the door any little distraction is going to disrupt your state of flow and concentration, basically scare off the muse. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's the key is a lot of the transformative stuff because something already exists and we're just changing it a bit. When you come back to it, there's still something to anchor you to where you were. Like if we are working on an editing project and you got to paragraph two before you got interrupted, when you come back, you may need to read a couple sentences to re-anchor yourself, but you have a thing to anchor you to where you were and then keep going from there. If you are in generative mode, you don't have it quite the same way because in generative mode, we're straddling two worlds, right? We're straddling the world we're living in in our head and the world of reality, and we are bridging the two. And that takes a fair amount of, of energy. It takes a fair amount of willpower. It takes a fair amount of... of um, you know, belief in our own abilities and any interruption to any of those things, I think can kind of derail us really easy. So um, maybe let's talk a little bit about what we do ourselves to help not get pulled out of that state of flow. Because I think if you are trying to protect some generative time every day, there are there are some things that you can do. And I know we've both developed a few of them that we can share and hopefully they will be helpful for you also. So for you, what are some things you do? Because you've got that time set aside in the morning. Um, what are some things you do to protect that time or to set yourself up to use it well? It was something that I actually said on the theme of the protecting. Uh, protecting your writing time is paramount and it's important and everybody should know that. Um, what I do is I kind of put a system in place uh, to protect those two first couple of hours of the day. Uh, and one is, believe it or not, it's weird, but it works. Uh, I don't have breakfast before um writing because i know it's going to take time out of that routine what i need to know when i wake up is just like uh wash myself uh, uh dressing and then going uh, downstairs or in a coffee shop when it was possible and just jot down those two hours and then and hear me out this is weird but as a price uh, i get breakfast so i will get pre breakfast between 9 30 to 10 30 um and it's not like you have to do like me, but I found out that um, the system in place that I put of reward and kind of punishment, although punishment is a very strong word, works. 
uh, although I've been told that I'm very good at punishing myself, but not at giving me price. So even if I achieve something, I will not give you anything. <laughs> so breakfast, you get breakfast, okay? But yeah, but this is it's <laughs> just another story. It's the way I, I'm, I'm made. But yes, this is in the system. My system uh, says that you have to wake up when the alarm clock uh, sound. And most, most often than not, I will wake up for a reason or another, Christoph, before even the, the alarm clock. I don't know why. Maybe I'm wired that way because I'm, I'm eager to. And even though I have those two to three minutes that I told you about of fear, it's almost always overcome immediately because I know, okay, this is the work. This is what, what I'm supposed to do. Uh, this is the uh, generative part of my day. My entire career is based on those two hours right now. So if you don't give it everything you got, you're dead. Doesn't mean how many books you already have, backlist and that kind of stuff. It's important, but you have to be in, uh, you have to be able to generate a new content. A new content, uh, most of time than not, and this is just me, it's not good. So I need to generate even more than that. Um, I would say 75% of the content I write never, hopefully, and luckily, you never see it. <laughs> you will never <laughs> see that stuff. So you will see like the 15 to 20% polished stuff that I write and rewrite and rewrite. And should I say it again? Rewrite, <laughs> rewrite and rewrite. Uh, but again, that's the, that's the way I protect uh, my writing time with the process that I uh, follow uh, methodically and the second thing that I do is telling myself the right story uh, we mentioned this in a few a few episodes ago but we didn't really talk about that a lot what does it mean to telling yourself you know, uh, a different kind of story it means that you believe in yourself basically I believe that uh, the, the novella that I'm going to publish uh, in a couple of weeks is going to be better than the first three short stories that I wrote why? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Because I've uh, sweat blood over this and because I've learned stuff. So that's a story I repeat to myself as a mechanism in place to protect myself and creating content. Slowly but steadily, you are getting better, a bit better, a bit better. And this is not delusional, hopefully. Uh, it because, it's because like people are telling me that uh, after stories that, I re- that, that they are reading. So. It's very important the story you tell yourself. Um, I don't know if I told you uh, this, but there is a story from Tool of Titans, which is a book that I I was mentioning. And um, I really hope I'm not screwing this up, but uh, Timothy Ferris went to Kenny's West, Kenny West, the singer house. And and it's a huge villa, right? It's a mansion, it's huge. And Timothy Ferris was going around and at some point he, he saw a huge poster of Kenny West. And he was like, why is there a huge poster of yourself in your house? And he was like, Kenny said, because if I'm not my first fan, who's going to cheer for me when I'm not ready or when I'm not feeling it? And I thought like that could be, that conveying exactly what I'm trying to say. Kenny's telling himself his own story in a bright way. And that doesn't mean that you have to like Kenny West or not. The juice, the point is this. If you tell yourself the right story, I believe that the generation part is going to be easier for you because you're going to be removing the most effective kind of resistance that you have in place, which is fear. It's, it's fear of yourself that you're not going be, to be able to achieve your potential. So again, it's routine, Crystal, for me, and then it's telling the story. Very, very important stuff. That's what I set up. And hopefully, uh, uh, as uh, I go about and... Uh, I go forward with my writing career. I'm going to have some other system set in place. I'm sure you have something else. But for now, in the mix, I have these two tools. What kind of tools do you have? <laughs> my, my tools are um, almost an absence of tools in that I find to get into that generative mode, I really need to not have inputs already. So for me, I write earlier in the day, not because I like mornings. I I don't necessarily like mornings, but because I need to do the output before I have 
all the inputs from other places that are kind of derailing where my brain was going or causing me to make choices about things or causing me to think about things. So I think of generation as it's coming from inside of me. And so I try to make sure that anything that happens in the day before I'm sitting down to do the writing is only me putting things out to the world, not the world putting me uh, towards me, right? So my rules for myself are in the morning, I cannot check social media or check my email or do any of those other things that would bring the world into my head until after I've done my writing time. If, if I'm going to have a shot at being focused, I can't let the news of the day or what someone else has posted on Instagram or, you know, the two emails that people send that I check that will say, oh, I just need your help for a minute with this thing. It just switches the track of your brain and it immediately puts you into a place where you have to get your attention back from that, which is making it harder than it needs to be. So um, I, if I am going to do other stuff before I write in the morning, then I will get up. I will maybe go for a walk around the park where I'm just soaking in some oxygen and getting the blood flowing. And I'm thinking about the scene I'm going to work on, or I'm thinking about the chapter I'm going to write in the nonfiction book so that I can get my brain working and I can figure out what I'm going to say before I'm sitting down to say it, because that also helps me avoid that point where you first sit down at your computer and you're like, right, this is my writing time. I'm going to write. And you're like, what should I write? And, and then you're processing. But if you can have the least amount of time between when your butt hits the chair and your fingers start typing or your voice starts dictating, the smaller that amount of time, the least likely you're going to suddenly need to get up and go do something else or fill your water bottle or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and you get more practiced at that, I think, the more often you do it. But really just being aware that you don't want too much incoming stimulus before you're sitting down to write, if you can arrange it. Obviously, there's going to be people who don't have that as an option. If you're, you know, my, my kid's all grown up, so um, she's not she's not even home. She has her own place. So there's no like worrying about little people in the morning, none of that stuff. So if your life does not allow for that, that's okay. It does not mean all hope is lost. It just means that maybe you need to um, spend the first five to seven minutes, five to 10 minutes of your writing time doing a focus meditation. Maybe you need to throw some headphones on. You need to close your eyes. You need to get comfortable and, and just get yourself centered and back in the zone so you can leave all those other distractions behind before you dive into the writing. Different things work for different people, but having a little bit of a, a break beforehand, whether it's a walk, some fresh air, or just doing some meditation, sitting right in your office chair, uh, will often be enough to kind of reset things for people. So that's one of them. I also, I find I have to be in a, at a certain level of mental wellness and mental health to be able to work on the really generative stuff. And I find when I'm going to write fiction, it's all about creating conflict in your characters' lives. And so I often find I need to feel settled enough in myself and my world that I can make things more conflicty without feeling like I'm pushing it all over the edge. And so um, for me, when I'm trying to get into that state or I'm trying to protect that creative state, I often need to take a break from the news for a few days, or I may take a break from reading certain types of book or watching certain types of TV that I find kind of trigger my emotional feelings of like not being very safe. I love like thrillers and CSI and like murder investigation stuff. And I used to read a lot of horror, but if I'm sitting down to like, work on a romance novel. I need rainbows and puppies and kittens and I need to feel like I firmly believe in happily ever after. And so if the world around me is filled with chaos, it may mean that I have to watch a romantic comedy before I'm in the right headspace to be able to do that. And that's okay. So I think just knowing for yourself, um, what are the criteria for you to feel creatively generative? And then looking at, is there anything in my environment I can adjust to make that possible? So, you know, my office, uh, one small window that has a, a curtain on it so I can literally close out the outside world when I need to. And I have 
colors I like and soft, cozy blankets and things that make me feel safe and happy and that remind me of good things in the world. That's what I have that surrounds me when I'm trying to get into that zone of doing the writing. So I think, yeah, just knowing what are your, what are your conditions and then trying to replicate that to a point where you're not completely dependent on those things to feel like you're able to. It's not that you have to have them to be able to do it. Those are the optimal conditions. And as we all know, sometimes things are not optimal, but we want to train ourselves to have the help, but not be completely dependent on it. Um, Because if something happens, like when our house got flooded, my office basically disappeared overnight. um, And I needed to still be able to keep working on things even even though all my patterns and my habits were were kind of shook up, um, I needed still to know which were the actual key pieces. And so I, I talked a bit about that in one of our other podcast episodes, which was just knowing that I had my laptop, knowing that I had the two craft books that I really depend on for creating my characters and the cozy magical blanket that my mom made for me. Um, those are my three things I require. And I I can then write anywhere as long as I have those three things. (laughs) Again, as we are saying, like the process is not really important. It's important that it works for you. If you can stand the crystal another writer's story, this one is about Paolo Coelho, the writer of The Alchemist. And I think it's a good uh, exemplification and explanation of uh, how every writer has a different process. And this is again a story from uh, uh, Tools of uh, Tools of Titans from Timo de Paris, and uh, Tim was asking to Paulo Coelho, so how does your writing uh, process work? So like, what's your routine? And so Paulo Coelho answers, I procrastinate until I feel guilty, and then I sit down and write for hours. So that's his process. It's completely different from mine, for example, or other writers. But it shows you how powerful it is, this idea that it doesn't matter what you're doing. It matters why you're doing it. Uh, It matters for sure for how long you're doing it. But it doesn't matter like the calendar. You don't have to check. For me, it works better to just uh, uh, work it every day. For Crystal, as many other authors, it works like on a different scale. But listen to the story. Like Paolo Coelho is one of the most famous and... um, uh, crafter uh, out there in the writing works and he says he has to procrastinate to write if he can say that i think this gives you an amount of liberty uh, it keeps uh, the pressure off your shoulder in this sense and i think it gives you the freedom of just giving you yourself to uh, permission to fail to just write something it doesn't work write something else because every writer have uh, is or her own process there is nothing like the right process or the wrong process just sit and write that's the only thing that matters generate new content yes absolutely and i think if we shift our focus a little bit so what happens when either that just doesn't work or when you get to the point in your day if you are lucky enough to have enough hours in your day that you've got some time for writing but you still have more time um, that you could put towards things it is great to have then your list of transformative things that you can do that don't require quite as much energy maybe don't require quite as much focus or attention and those are great to know what those tasks are so that when you have those moments or when you have the extra time in your day that you can devote to them, you are able to transform things. And so let's talk a little bit about what are some of the, what are some of the manifestations of transformation? Like if we take it out of a concept into the physical world of a writer, what are some of the ways we could see transformation uh, or transformational creativity in the writer's world? Yeah, and I'll, I'll do that with like um, very concrete uh, examples. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm doing now on that transformation side. Uh, so one of the things that I'm doing is like uh, I have a story, a science fiction story in, Ita- in uh, English, Glass into Steel. I'm translating it into Italian. That's a very good example of uh, uh, transformation. Like I don't have to reinvent the wheels. I actually started today uh, doing that. And my objective, my goal is to make it like a, uh, a candy, if you, if you will, 
uh, uh, a prize for people that in Italy are going to subscribe to my Italian newsletter, science, uh, science fiction newsletter. So it's something that is going to take time, some energy, uh, but I don't really have to think about that too much. I just need to translate the, a sentence after the other. That's very transformative. Like I think it's as transformative as it gets. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing is uh, I'm uh, looking at my website right now and trying to improve it. So what I just did a few hours uh, ago before the, this recording was like I went over my website and see, okay, how can, it, can I make it more user-friendly? So I removed some uh, uh, links, I removed some, some images, I adapted it to my new strategy of the, we call it the, the book over, uh, series uh, uh, book over. Uh, so that's another example of transformative things. The website is already there. I don't need to think about that. I just need to remove things, to change it. Um, and another thing that I'm doing, uh, this is on the, it's more on the, something related to myself. Uh, I'm trying to read uh, more books that I believe might be useful for the transformative kind of phase and kind of things. Uh, and those books are productive. Uh, if I can, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, double down my effort on, on this new kind of knowledge and I can reduce the timing of transformative think of 20% or 30% in the long run is going to make so much difference for me. So I'm investing that time in learning the transformative. How can I do um, the transformative things better? And it's something that I did it before knowing the name, but now that I know the name and the family name of this thing, I can really dig deeper into it. I can search a book that is talking about this concept, maybe with a different name, but a book that is going to... Uh, I mean, how do you say leapfrog? Like when you do a jump, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, leapfrog. Leapfrog. And I think it's important. Like for the generational and transformation, I think like you can definitely learn by doing, but like there are resources out there, Kristal, on the produ productive side that can help you do those things faster and better. I suspect it's a bit more different, difficult with the generation, uh, the generational kind of things. Uh, but uh, uh, it can be done, and if you are um, reading a book on the craft of writing, definitely it's going to help you. It's going to give you some tips. Uh, so I would say those three examples that I uh, gave on what I'm doing right now for real uh, might give you an idea of what transformation means and why it's important for me to learn as much as I can on how to do it better day after day after day. And I'm sure you, Crystal, you're going to have more, way more than three examples because you are <laughs> constantly transforming things, not only for you, but also for other people because you also had or used to, used to have some client uh, works. Uh, and I guess like there was a lot of that there, right? Yeah, pretty much my entire business, um, my consulting business, and also all of the stuff that I do with the organizations I work with and I'm on some boards. But really, everything we do is transformation. It is examining what exists, asking ourselves what's working, what could we be doing better? How could we be doing it better? You know, what are the options? And then narrowing down the options to what's the next thing we're going to do. And then looking at what are the steps we need to take to do that and then carrying it out and then repeating that process again. So you know, for me, it's really looking at um, what are the questions we, we need to ask ourselves? Because I think the questions in a transformation process are the same, really, regardless of what you're doing. And if we apply it specifically to our writer business, when we're looking to transform something, we could ask ourselves the following questions. We could say, um, how is this working for us right now? And so you might look at book sales, you might look at uh, reviews, you might look at your data in your mailing list, but this is going to be external feedback or data that's coming in through whatever way you're measuring things for you to look at, okay, how is it working so that you have a baseline because you need somewhere to start. You need to know what you're working with right now. And then you can ask yourself, could this be working better? So 
if you know the industry average for open rates for mailing lists is 15% and you're at 10%, then you know it could be working better, right? Um, and we're not big on being average. We like to be above average. And so if we take the industry average, then we want to shoot for something just above it. But most important is that you're moving upwards from your baseline. So if you are at the point where your book is selling maybe five copies a week, and you want to shift that needle up even to six copies a week, then you want, you need to transform something. You need to look at, okay, is it my book cover? Is it where my book is placed? So our third question is, what could I transform to make a change here? What could I change to get a better outcome? And then making a list of all of the possibilities. So, okay, for my book sales, it might be the cover. It might be the book description. It might be that I'm not running any ads. It might be that I'm not doing any kind of promotion. It might be that my book is in the wrong category on Amazon, right? There are lots of different things that could be contributing to why that book isn't selling. Maybe you need more reviews. Maybe you need the reviews that are there to be better. Maybe you need five more pages to be in a different link category, right? You, you just need to make a list of all of the things that you could change. And then when you look at those, pick one. <laughs> and when you're, when you're kind of new to this, it's tempting to change everything at the same time, but then you don't know what worked. And if you are looking at being able to replicate this again later on a different book, or you want to know which pieces were the key ones so that when you do your next project, you can do those. Or if it's a, a situation where you could level up something and level it up again, if it's working, you need to know if it worked. So just like you know, high school biology class when you're doing experiments with things or um, any kind of science class really from school, you change one variable at a time because if you change two things, you don't know which thing it was that worked. So even if there's only a week or two between pieces that you change, sometimes that makes sense. Now, it may be really clear to you looking at something that let's say your book cover, maybe you did it yourself a long time ago and it's really not quite where it wants to be to be market, uh, marketable and competitive. And you also maybe wrote your book description before you learned all this stuff about how to write a good book description. You can go ahead and change both of those things at once. Um, if you know that they need to be better and you know how to make them better, go ahead and make them better, right? That's part of your book sales makeover process, which we'll do a whole separate episode on a book sales makeover so we can deep dive into all the steps in that process. But um, you want to you wanna make what changes that you know have to be made right away. And then if there are things you want to experiment with, like ads or doing newsletter swaps or things like that, you want to make sure that whatever you transform first is the thing that will have the most ongoing benefits for you. So when you're weighing different options, and this was something that we talked about at our coaching session on Monday, it was, okay, well, if you fix, if you fix your advertising first and you're driving more traffic to your book, but you haven't fixed the cover and you haven't fixed your book description and you haven't cleaned up your insides of your book, the chances of that person actually purchasing it when they land on your book are much lower. So you're wasting a lot of energy in ramping up your ads. And then you don't really know how well they're working because if people get there, the ad worked, it brought them to the book, but they don't purchase then you've lost an opportunity. So when you're doing this, you want to kind of work backwards. So you want to know, okay, I want my reader to, you know, click on the ad and then I want them to come to my book uh, listing on Amazon. And then I want them to read the description and decide to buy the book and then read the book and love the book and join my newsletter list. So there's a lot of different stages in there. Um, but you want to transform the thing first that will have the best ongoing consequences for you, right? Or transform the thing that's going to become a stumbling block in a successful reader journey or a successful aspect of growing your business. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. Like you have to take uh, one stone, one bird at a time, I, I'd say. Like you have to take one thing at a time. You have to concentrate on one thing. Um, you don't have to give anything for granted. Uh, if you think like there is something that 
might be better. That's just one person on the planet, which is you, which you are your bias. So you shouldn't think to yourself as a very good uh, market indicator, if you will. Um, and I think like everything you said can be conduct to the word the testing. Like you need to do a lot of testing in order to get uh, get data. I think this is very important for the transformation uh, kind of thing. Like you can definitely do it by yourself, but it's better if you ask around. And by asking around, I mean like not necessarily going out and shooting, uh, shouting uh, for help, but doing hard ads. It's one of those ways when you get a cold shower because you will get uh, when you get like thousands and thousands of impressions for example in your amazon ads and nobody's clicking you start understanding there is a problem maybe in your color or uh, for amazon ads you get a lot of impression you get a lot of clicks but nobody is buying your book what is to fix probably the description that's important that's basically one of the way for you to understand your data is talking and these are people that don't know you so they're not biased they are acting as a customer, as a client that has no relation with you. Uh, and that's valuable because they are basically telling you in an indirect way that your cover doesn't work. Maybe for that kind of genre, your description doesn't take them and you have to list them. That's the most difficult part. I can tell you because I'm on in this process now of the transformation thing. And I think it's human. Like, uh, Crystal, if somebody comes to you and say, hey, your book cover sucks. Or maybe, hey, it's not very good. And you got some of these uh, uh, stories to tell. I, I think you told me like that sometimes you used to sell some of your books to people and maybe some people, are, they have no, how would you say? No no, no kind of... Uh, no filter. Filter, filter you said. <laughs> yes, yeah, they have yeah. no filter. They was, and they had no idea that you were the author maybe. It was like, oh, this yeah. is just a lady that is like, or a girl that is selling the stuff. But I don't think that you felt like, ah, it's not important. You would have, I have to really punch that guy in the face or something like that. But you you don't have that luxury, basically, especially when you are broad and uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people are seeing your, uh, your books through ads, for example. You just simply have to be serious. Uh, and you have to sit and you have to study the data. You have to give enough time to the data to speak to you. Because if you're running an ad, Amazon ads, for example, for three days, not a good uh, way to take a decision. You, you need a, at least a couple of weeks, 10 days. We were talking about that uh, in other venues, uh, Crystal. So transformative is important, but that data, uh, give yourself some time and don't rely on what you think is the best choice for your product. Uh, let other people tell you what's wrong and what's not wrong. <laughs> I would say this is important to remember. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Transformation even though it it seems easier on the front side when you're just looking at, okay, generation, creating something out of nothing, very challenging. The fear is all right up front because you're like, well, if I put myself in this chair and I go to tell this story and it doesn't work, I'm going to feel like an idiot. But transformation is is really hard in a different way because you do, as you said, you have to be brutally honest with yourself and you have to know your why, because I think it's one of those things where you need to know what you want as an outcome and you need to know why you want that change. And then you can make decisions accordingly, because yes, it's true in, in opening yourself up and doing the transformative process, whether it is getting editorial feedback from a paid editor, whether it's having beta readers read your book and tell you what they don't love, your your transformation process is an invitation to the negative because you have to invite in what is not working in order to change it into something that is working. And that is hard when what we're dealing with, it's our business, it's our books, it's our stories, it's our passion, all of these things, you are inviting someone to tell you what doesn't work. So yes, it, it can be quite emotionally intense to go through that and you do have to be brutally honest and you have to understand it may not matter how much you love something if it doesn't work for your market then you need to change that and 
I have been in those situations and I, you know, I have many things that are currently in those situations and it won't just be a matter of choosing, oh, well, I've got the option to do this with a cover or do that with a cover. Maybe there's a thousand dollar difference in the price to do those two things. So sometimes we are not going to choose the thing that we know would be the ideal thing for our business. Maybe we can't afford yet to hire that cover designer that we are absolutely lusting after uh, their images. Maybe we are just not there yet. So I think it's really important to be aware when you're transforming something. Okay, here's my end goal. This is what I want. Here's how far I can take it right now. But every incremental change you make is going to increase your chances of getting to that end goal eventually. And so I think knowing where we're at, making the changes we can afford to make, the changes we know how to make, the changes we can learn to make, and then reevaluating and then looking at it again. And if the changes are working at that low level of investment, then you're able to take the revenue that you're going to see as an increase over what you had before, and you're going to be able to reinvest that. And I think doing it that way, not necessarily, you know, taking out a big loan and going all the way to the end zone um, with that cover designer or whatever, you don't have to do that in order to still move forward. And, you know, we've talked about this a couple of times. Sometimes it's actually better if you don't go all the way at that early stage because you haven't perfected all your other processes in your reader journey. You haven't perfected your onboarding emails. You haven't perfected maybe your story still needs a little bit of finessing and you're just now getting enough feedback because um, just like with the ads until you have enough data to work with you don't actually know where that story is positioned in the market so you need a certain amount of people to have read your books before your reviews are really reflecting what the wider market thinks about those stories so yeah I think just be gentle with yourself but also don't be afraid to make those small improvements, even if you can't get to where perfect is yet or where the ideal would be yet. Just that one degree of change towards where you want to go will eventually get you there. And, you know, every one little thing you can do will make a difference in the outcome overall. So. On that note, and in the interest of repeating things, so we're less afraid of them. I am going to bring out the curious jar, which uh, tends to evoke some interesting reactions in my lovely co-host. It comes. Uh, it comes. Something wicked this way comes. <laughs> Something curious this way comes. So I refilled the jar. Oh, look at that. I know. So like many questions. Filled. It's like that? filled with rainbow papers for oh, any of yes, you who are watching out there. Um, I'm going to rifle my hand around in here until you say stop. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Stop. Okay. You have like 20,000 in your hand. Ooh, one. It's green. A green one today. Okay. Okay. Bring it on. Ooh, all right. This is like, this could not be a better question for today's episode. Um, okay. The one thing I'd like to change about my writing is... I swear that is what it says. Yeah, uh, you can't read my writing, but that's okay. Uh, this is on the difficult question side. This is one of the sadistic kind of things when you really have to explore to open your heart and just stub it with yeah. stuff. You want me to go first? I know yes, how to please. answer this go, one. Go, go, okay. go, go, go. So, um, I mean, besides just doing more of it, which is kind of the thing I would always like to change about it, um, I would. The thing I struggle with is not enough description in my writing. Um, and it's something that that came really to my attention when I started doing audiobooks. And I think that translation or transformation from a page, a story on the page to a story that's told out loud was really interesting for me. Part of the process of making an audiobook is um, I hired professionals. I did not narrate them myself. So once the voice actor has recorded everything and you're at the part of the process where you're reviewing it, it's kind of like editing a story after you've written it. 
you have to listen to the whole thing word by word by word by word and you have to compare it to your manuscript and make sure that it's accurate or the whisper sync breaks for kindle so that's a thing um but it was fascinating to sit there and listen to your own story being read back to you it highlights everything about your writing that's wrong <laughs> and so from a transformational perspective it was very very interesting to see where i wasn't using enough physical description and where I wasn't quite capturing enough of the detail in the scene in, in what was going on physically around the dialogue. So um, maybe it's because I picture everything so clearly in my head that I sometimes forget to say it out loud as in put it in the story. And so that is something I would like to change about my writing after having listened to, I don't know, eight or nine audiobooks. Um, with each one, it just kind of highlighted more and more like, okay, I need to, to think about the people who are listening to the stories, not just the people who are reading them on the page and filling in the blanks that way. So I, I am going to work on that. That is a project for um, my next book. I've been trying to amp up the descriptions of characters and settings and, um, and action all over the place. So that's, That's me. Was that enough time? Did I buy you enough minutes? Yeah, it was. So it was description. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. If you had asked me that question two years ago, uh, I would have said, I would have told you this. Um, I wish I were born uh, an English native speaker because so I didn't, I would not have to have all of these problems every single time. Not only I'm talking to people, uh, uh, but also I'm writing because every every single time, as you might know, like I have to translate everything in my head, and it's very frustrating. Uh, but I now know that it's part of my process, and I think like the way I write is because of this, or what I consider to be a deficiency that the fact that I didn't have any uh, grammar formation, or I wasn't, I didn't go in an English school, you know, like this is something that I always fear that I'm not good enough because of that, because I didn't have that, uh, I didn't go through that process that you, Crystal, did, and or basically the other people. Uh, but I don't know how it's going to sound, hopefully not in the wrong way, but to answer your question, uh, what would I change of my writing is uh, nothing. And the reason is because I, I know my writing now kind of, um, I, don't, I don't want to say it sucks, but I, I want to say it's very weak. Uh, but it's like a very, it's a starting point. Okay, listen, uh, it's a very, very basic starting point. It's very difficult for me to go down so I can just bounce up. And I'm learning every single day something new. But if I tell you now, I, will, I, I really wish like my dialogue dialogues were better or I just I wish that I understood more of English uh, construct and syntax and rules but the way I'm writing now it's just because I have these two um, background like the Italian background and the English background uh, and if I change anything I'll, I'll be too much afraid of telling different stories genetically different not cosmetically different and I don't want that to happen because that wouldn't be Michela Mitrani anymore. So if you read one of my stories now, um, that is the first draft, I, I, I don't think you will understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, they're that bad. <laughs> but the thing is, um, I'm very stubborn. So when I write a story, I'll write once, uh, one time. And again, because I, I really like to give a concrete example, uh, I'm going to tell you the April story that I'm going to publish uh, in a couple of weeks. So the very first draft uh, was uh, 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 6,000 words. I wrote five drafts after that, and the fifth draft became 15,000 words. So it was three times as much. But I assure you, if I had handed you the first uh, draft, you, I don't think you would have understood what I was trying to say, because it was like English written uh, thinking Italian. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's super weird and you would think like uh, okay i'm giving you the option to change that right the today's today's uh, um, paper was about that right like change something change that right 
I, I don't want to do that. I, I enjoy really a lot going on the process of rewriting the story like multiple times. And I think that's what makes me me. So again, I don't know how it sounds, but this is the truth. So I wouldn't change anything. I don't know, what, what do you think? <laughs> like, it's, uh, yeah, it's I mean, really I've, I've read your writing and I think, I think you are correct in that your voice comes from the, like the lyrical Italian flow of language <laughs> being translated into English sentences I think that is part of what makes your voice. So I, I agree, like, I don't see changing that as a good way to go. I think you're already looking at changing your writing. You're taking masterclass classes, you're all of those things, but that's building skills as opposed to fundamentally changing who you are as a storyteller. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's that's an important distinction. But, um, but that was a sneaky one. Today it was a sneaky one, right? right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch more, but we also need more sneaky ones because uh, we can never have too many questions. It is a curious jar. It wants to know all the things. So if you could come up with a question and email us at ideas at strategic com, then we will add your question on a rainbow paper into the jar. And we would like to get to know you as well. So in our show notes, we have a repeated the curious jar question and there's a section where you can leave a comment telling us the answer to that question for you so what is the one thing you would change about your writing and for the show notes uh links to resources that we mentioned uh today and coupons and discounts on tools we love uh, you can visit us at strategic entrepreneur.com and you can also subscribe to our newsletter. And each week, we'll make sure to send you just one thing that we think will help you on your entrepreneur journey and a link to our latest episode. And if you are a competitive player in the game of life, you will get gold star and a million bonus points in the game of life if you leave us a review wherever you listened to this podcast. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to join us today and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on our next episode. We will be talking with Eileen Cook about building better characters and about increasing the conflict in your stories. So, you know, now that we've talked about how to calm things down, we're going to teach you all about how to ramp things back up. So we look forward to seeing you then. Bye bye. Take care. This. You can. I have that book too. Wow, it's the same. It's with the hardcover kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it's um. You could like use it as a doorstop or a weapon. It's like oh, no, really? It's like it's a, this huge. is a weight. When it, it came from Amazon and the box was like gigantic, I was like, "What is this? <laughs> what is it? Yeah. And I did not realize how fat this book was. So we have it. I've read Commander. it some time ago. Yeah, but um, it's still actual like very interesting so Amanda Palmer everything good good love it you can tell the true character of a man by how his dog and his kids react to him it's so cool it's powerful oh, it is <laughs> in, in so many ways yes. <laughs> in so many layers it's onion onionally powerful <laughs> onionally powerful you see you just created and that's a crystal audio. word don't use that yeah, no, no, no. between me about. you and the wall it's yeah. a wall yes <laughs> very oniony in its layers as shrek would say <laughs> <laughs> have you seen shrek do you know do you know shrek yeah, it's like one, two, three, four, fifty-five. Yeah. Which one? Uh huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. one. I think it's one. And he's talking about how onion or ogres are like onions, like they uh -huh. have layers to them. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So now <laughs> we we describe things as very oniony, which just means they have a lot of layers. Yeah, <laughs> it's like code in our house. It's humans. So like uh, we are onions. So like a layer. Right? Yeah. <laughs>